28, he was among 35 new astronauts chosen from more than 8,000 candidates. He was picked not for his military background or flying experience, but because he was a scientist. In the early days of space exploration, astronauts were chosen for their lightning-quick reflexes or their ability to take punishment in what was then the unknown world of space. Most were military test pilots who became international heroes with the right stuff. Today, space travel is less mysterious. Spacecraft are more comfortable and safer to use. So Jeff's job is not to conquer space, but to work in it. He and other mission specialists are on board to deploy and rescue satellites, conduct scientific experiments, and with Jeff's background in astronomy, he'll be studying Halley's Comet in one of his later flights. Jeff is representative of a new kind of space traveler, people like you and me, who one day may fly in space. A few years ago, we began following Jeff Hoffman as he prepared for his first flight into space. Well, the first place we're going to, Ira, is called the Orbiter 1G Trainer. 1G, of course, stands for one gravity because we're here on the Earth. It'd be nice to be able to train up in orbit. But... At the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Jeff was my instructor as I learned what it's like to be an astronaut in training. Well, let's climb up to the flight deck where we can have a look around. Now, you realize if you were really getting into the shuttle before a launch, the whole thing would be vertical and we would be uh, standing on our sides and it would look very different from the way it looks now. Astronauts in training spend lots of time in simulators, exact copies of different living and working areas aboard the spacecraft. Here in the cockpit simulator, pilots and mission specialists acquaint themselves with five of the most important members of the ship. And there was one more question I had about living in space. What do you do when you have to go to the bathroom? You'd be surprised at how similar the uh, space shuttle toilet looks to what you'd see in any uh, airplane. Um, the main thing that we don't have up here is gravity to make everything go to the inside of the toilet. And so we replace gravity with airflow. There are mm -hmm. fans inside which create a, uh, part, a suction to basically pull everything down into the toilet. Making a workout, inventions like the tie-down treadmill make jogging in space possible. And even though space sickness is still an unresolved problem for many astronauts, Tests like these in the rotating chair are helping us understand why. And to become accustomed to the actual feeling of weightlessness, Jeff has spent many hours in an airplane the astronauts affectionately call the Vomit Comet. As the plane soars and dives in the sky, it can simulate zero gravity for 30 seconds at a time. What does it feel like to be weightless? Uh, like Superman. Really? <laughs> you can fly through the air. And of course, that's, that's one of the things which everybody who's been up to space uh, can't stop talking enough about, is just the, the pure delight of zero gravity. It's something people never get tired of. I don't think I have any fears about weightlessness. It, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, it, it's such a new environment. Uh, Once in zero gravity, most astronauts go through a brief adjustment period, getting used to floating through the spacecraft, getting over temporary nausea, using the equipment in a new environment. But Jeff isn't very concerned about these adjustments. No, Jeff is a little bit concerned about something else, getting the hiccups. Uh, everybody has their own personal cure for the hiccups, and my cure for the hiccups has always been to drink a glass of water upside down. Now, I've never heard of anybody talking about getting the hiccups up in space, and maybe most cures would work, but since there's no up and, and no down, <laughs> If I ever did, I don't think I'd be able to drink the water upside down. So, well, I'll let you know what happens if I get the hiccups up there. A pioneering experiment sure to go down in the history of medicine. Speaking of pioneering, space food has come a long way since the early days of space travel. I remember one of the things I have to learn to do for my shuttle flight is how to prepare and eat food in space. You have to learn how to do that. Well, you know, the fact that I'm able to hang my vegetables on the wall by Velcro should indicate that there's something different about <laughs> yeah. food in space. Space food is no longer squeezed out of tubes or pressed into pills. Space food is now very much like camping food. Sometimes it comes canned or compressed into foil pouches. But since the fuel cells on board the shuttle produce water, it makes sense to store most of the food dehydrated or dried out like meat and vegetable casseroles, or the famous astronaut orange drink. Then all you do is add water. Eight ounces cold water, two to five minutes. Okay. 
set it to eight ounces. Okay. Now we align this with the All pin right. there. So it sits in. We insert it. And we look for the cold button. Okay. Hmm. Voila. NASA has gone out of its way to make meal time more like sitting around the kitchen table. So, if you like your food a little spicier, just reach for the taco and Tabasco sauce right on board. Salt and pepper are there too, in liquid form, of course. No one wants to inhale floating peppercorns. And where else would your eating utensils include a pair of scissors? You notice they've given us a, a vegetable with sauce in it. If you had just little pieces of cauliflower or peas floating around, it wouldn't be really very good for space flight. They'd all come flying out as soon as we open it up. But since they're a little bit wet and sticky, they will stick to the container. Right. The thing you don't want to happen here is, is they'll stick just as easily to the cover. And it has happened to people that they'll cut it open like that, and the whole mass of food will be sticking to the cover, and it just opens up with you as, oh, as you take mess. the thing off. Then you need the uh, shuttle laundry uh, service. <laughs> Jeff's flight this time won't include any planned spacewalks. But should something outside the spacecraft need fixing, he has to be prepared to go outside for an emergency EVA, an extravehicular activity, as NASA calls it. So part of Jeff's training includes getting fitted for his spacesuit. Of course, in space, getting into the suit will be a lot easier. That long underwear he's wearing is one of the most important parts of his clothing. It's made of plastic mesh with... What is the next exercise? It's a payload bay door drive cut. Payload bay door drive cut, okay. To simulate working in weightlessness, Jeff goes underwater. There he and a fellow astronaut practice using space tools. He gets the feel of a specially made wrench. He discovers how his body would react to twists and turns while repairing a faulty shuttle part or retrieving a wayward satellite. Dave, does it look like it's in there? Yeah, turn it. Okay. On every shuttle flight, you have to have two people who are capable of going out in spacesuits to handle emergencies. The most serious are emergencies which would keep the shuttle from returning to Earth, like if for some reason you couldn't close your payload bay doors. You know, the environment that we're working in space is, is completely unforgiving of mistakes, either, either by people or problems with machinery. You can't survive very long without a whole bunch of things working correctly, and we know that. And that always has to be in the back of my mind when I'm training. Um, a lot of things, if they go wrong, we can't fix them. Uh, a lot of things, if they go wrong with the shuttle, uh, would endanger our mission. And if they went wrong enough, uh, could certainly en endanger people's lives. Uh, you know, we work in that environment. You can't get complacent about what you're doing. 10, we are going for main engine ignition. 6, we have main engine ignition. 3, 2, 1, and solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the first operational space shuttle mission with two satellites on board, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. The launch pads of Cape Canal have witnessed the ups and downs of America's space program. At times, the space effort has been an exercise in trial and error for NASA. Sometimes in the early days before manned spacecraft, it was a little difficult to get things off the ground. But eventually, they did work, and the early rockets of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo launched men into space, even put them on the moon. But the rockets were a one-shot affair, could not be reused. As engineers searched for more economical ways of putting people and their satellites into orbit, designers created intriguing new shapes and bold designs for spacecraft. They settled on a hybrid, a vehicle that would blast off like a rocket ship and float home like a glider. The space shuttle was born. There are now four shuttles, or more precisely, four orbiters. Cape Canaveral Launch Pad 39A is where the shuttle leaves the Earth. And as a reusable spacecraft, it returns here to the Kennedy Space Center to be refitted for its next flight. Touchdown. 
how does it all come together? Astronaut Jeff Hoffman traveled with us to Florida to give us a behind-the-scenes look. Ira, this is the orbiter processing facility. Wow. What it actually is is the shuttle hangar. This is where we bring the shuttle after each flight to clean it up and then prepare it and load the cargo for the next flight. You mean there's a shuttle in there somewhere? Yeah, well, you can see a little bit of the wing, oh, yeah. the wheel around there, and uh, well, come on around here. You can see some more. All right. Wow, here we are right under the belly of the ship, huh? Yeah, I think of this as the great black cloud because of the huge surface of black tiles under here. And, the tiles. and replace it with a new tile. After the processing facility, the shuttle is moved to the most prominent building at the center, the Vehicle Assembly Building, or the VAB. So, Ira, this is the Vehicle Assembly Building. Wow, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with its size. It's hard to get an impression, really, of how big it is until you see here at the Cape. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that, that maybe is hard to realize when you look around and you see the scale of everything, it, it's all on the scale of a, of a shipyard, you know, like the size of battleships and everything. And, and yet, when you look at the close-up work that the people are doing, it's got to be done with the cleanliness of a scientific laboratory. And, and that's, that's very impressive about all the operations down here. Equally impressive is the way the orbiter, now fitted with its rocket boosters and fuel tank, makes its exit from the vehicle assembly building. No longer rolled about on its wheels, the shuttle now rides upright atop a moving launcher platform that literally crawls at a snail's pace toward the launch pad. Everything about this man-made Caterpillar machine is staggering. Two stories high, 130 feet long, the crawler rides on eight tank-like tracks, each shoe of the tracks, and there are 52 of them, each shoe weighs a ton. With the shuttle on board, the total weight adds up to more than 14 million pounds, crushing the gravel roadway below into a fine powder. Totally loaded, the crawler can cruise along at one mile per hour. And as for mileage, how's 35 feet to the gallon sound? After the three-mile trip, the shuttle is lowered onto the launch pad where it undergoes final preparations for the launch. NRTC from AFM, I'm ready for the uh, post ingress switch reconfig. OK, stand by one, please. OFC, OT. Coming up on T minus one minute and counting. Sound. This launch was to be the maiden flight of the orbiter Discovery, and Jeff and his crew were following the mission carefully because they were scheduled to fly in the same orbiter two months later. T minus 31 seconds. We have a go for auto sequence start. Discovery's full redundant computers now taking over primary control of critical vehicle functions through liftoff. T minus 15 seconds and counting. Ten. We have a go for main engine start. Seven, six, five. We have main engine start. We have a cutoff. We have a, an abort by the onboard computers of the orbiter Discovery. Sometimes things don't go as planned. In this case, the rockets of orbiter Discovery ignite, but are immediately shut down. The computers on board, within a microsecond, sense a malfunctioning valve and abort the liftoff of the spacecraft. Jeff Hoffman is not aboard this flight, but he watches closely because this setback has a severe impact on Jeff's first flight into space. With just two months to go before his flight, Jeff learns he has been reassigned to another date, another mission. When we realized that we weren't going to fly in August and that when we were finally going to fly six Astronaut. months late. He knew his life as a scientist would never be the same. He also knew that if chosen, he could pursue his career and satisfy a lifelong dream of space travel. A dream, he says, that can now come true for lots of people. I've always thought that eventually, uh, people are going to be living in space, uh, living on other planets. It, it will be completely natural. And a thousand years from now, people can look back on this time in human history and, and say that you know, this is when it all started. This is when people first went out into space, first learned to live and, and work out there. Uh, to me, it's, it's you know, when I think like that, it's, it's uh, 
unbelievable. You know, I, I get to take part in it. It's just incredibly exciting. And I think that's when why most people, if you ask, would you like to go out into space, uh, you know, most people who, who would say yes would say it for that reason. You know, it's, it's new, it's exciting, uh, it's, it's almost unimaginable, and, and uh, you know, it, it's something that, that people dream about. Who, who would say no to being able to fulfill a dream?